What up, Puck Squad? Coming at you with a quick video today, including two videos from the reactions of the winners of my Huck Squad mystery box giveaway from the Dismania mystery box video last month. And I'm also going to be answering questions left on a video uh, reacting to my old episodes where I said I wanted people to leave questions for me to answer in an upcoming Q&A. So we got two reaction videos and we got some Q&A, so let's get right into it. First up, we have Matt Brockway, who won one of the Dismania mystery boxes, so I'll put that video right here. Alrighty. We got a tactic. Excellent. So that's it. Let's see. What is this? 52? Let's go. I just lost one of those. <laughs> DD2. That one's pretty. That stamp is cool, too. Whoa, what even is this? Looks like Game a disc. Of, a <laughs> Game of Thrones stamp. <laughs> There's more? It's a, oh, it's a DDX. Oh this is the one gosh. I lost in the, the park over there. You want to pose with it? <laughs> Ooh. Uh, oh my gosh. Method. How many are there? Seven, I think. Wow. <gasps> oh my gosh. It's the DD3. I needed oh. this. I just lost one. Are you so ready? There's, there's more. There's more. What is this? MD, MD3. Duh. Mess. He's kind of cool. <laughs> want to pop it on him? <laughs> is there anything under here? No, right. okay. Let's go. Off. Are you done? Can I turn it off? Yeah. Woohoo! And the next winner of the other mystery box was Lucas McKay of Lucas McKay Disc Golf. So I will put that one right here as well. Okay. Hi. Hello. Uh, Lucas McKay, winner of the Daily Disc Golf mystery box. Uh, just got it today. Just got back home from work. We're gonna open it up. I'm doing this in one take, so I apologize if this is bad in advance. I got it. Kind of. A little rip the box a little bit. All right, sweet. First off, of course, hook squad masks. Make sure it actually fits. It does. It's actually really comfortable too. Wow, well, I didn't I didn't expect that as much. Those piece is nice. Yeah, this is pretty sweet. All right, that's going on the back. I'm keeping, taking that with me on the course. First, we got new run of Color Glow FD3s. Sweet, 173, 175. Love it, love it. We've got here, XO, CD2. Nice, 175 as well. A little bit of marbling going on there. I don't know how long it's going to pop up, but yeah, super sweet. Feels great. All right. Ooh, this is going to be nice. We got an OTB stamped link, hard link. That is great. That is super sweet. Also a 175. Oh, this is dope. Yeah, we got a D-Line MD. These things are super, super convenient, super sweet to throw, get them beat up, super flippy. Yeah, that's awesome. Sweet. Oh, that's nice. Got a razor claw. 174. Nice and swirly. Just hit myself in the face right there. Yeah, sweet. Got a few of those on my shelf over there. Sweet. I love it. Perfect. Something that I was actually needing to get pick up. Just a plain stock Neo Instinct. 169. Ooh, a little lighter. That'll be fun to throw. Take that out to the field soon. See how that compares. I got a max weight one in my bag. All right, great. Ooh. Okay. I believe this is the Magician. Yep. Active Line Magician, the bar stamp. Okay. That looks super similar to the old first round FD2s, if y'all remember how that looked. Very similar in profile, yeah. It's gonna go in the bag too. I wanna go throw this. I'm kinda curious now, but that plastic feels sweet. It's my first time feeling the active line premium plastic, but yeah, that feels really good. All right, yeah, awesome. Anything in the flat? Nothing in the flat, that's okay. But we got a sticker. That's what's actually important. Um, but yeah, that's everything in the box. 
Thank you a ton, Daily Disc Golf Noah. I'm very fortunate I won this giveaway. I was very surprised, but very, very thankful. And yeah, I'm gonna have a lot of fun with a lot of these. A lot of these are gonna go out in the field with me and get tested, but overall, I appreciate you a ton. Thank you very, very much. I'm very grateful you selected my comment. And hopefully this isn't too horribly uh, made for your video you're gonna make with this, but like, subscribe, comment. You guys know all the big deal. Thanks. I was actually blown away by the responses that I got for that mystery box giveaway. There was like 715 or something uh, unique responses to that, which is just insane. I was not expecting that many responses. So thank you so much to everyone who's entered. I'm super glad that Matt and Lucas enjoyed their boxes and they did the unboxing on video for the channel. So thank you so much. I'm so glad that you guys have been supporting the channel and you guys totally deserve it. Matt actually has entered, I think, three or four giveaways over the course of this whole year, and then he finally won this one, so that was really cool to see as well. So we'll get right into the Q&A now. So, first question comes from Steven Durning asking, what is your favorite thing to do besides disc golf? So I was really into rock climbing for a lot, uh, a lot of time last year, and a little bit of time this year, um, but as anyone who's followed the channel knows, I broke my throwing hand last summer rock climbing, and it completely ended my tournament season. So I have a little bit of a bittersweet feeling towards it, but after I healed up, I have been back a couple times. I don't have a membership anymore. I probably go like once a month, once every two months, but it's not like a major hobby. Uh, I do like to play video games. I play computer games like RPGs, and I also play Xbox, but other than that, I work six days a week. I do the vlog, hang out with my friends. Um, not too much during the pandemic, but yeah, that's about it. Jason asks, where would you like to be in the next few years of your career? So, I don't know if you mean my disc golf career or my work career, um, but actually I have some good news regarding my work career. Just last week I was promoted to general manager of the Dairy Queen that I work at, so I'm really excited about that. A lot of hard work has gone into it. I've been working there for over eight years now. This past summer that we just got through was my eighth summer. I really enjoy it. The schedule is pretty good. Uh, it's really flexible and it allows me to get out and play disc golf during the week, during the day. And that is just like something that I really don't take for granted anymore. Uh, I do work weekends and I work six days a week. So yeah, I have one day off a week and I ha have to work my Saturdays and Sundays, but it works so well for my disc golf schedule. And in the winter time now, if you work a nine to five, you can pretty much only play on Saturday and Sunday. And I'm guessing most people don't play both of those days. So that kind of limits you to one round a week max for most people during the winter. Whereas if I'm working, you know, three or four night shifts this week, I can play, I have three or four or five mornings that I can play during the day while it's still bright out. And so that's a benefit that I have. That's really probably the biggest reason that I've stayed at my job over all these years is because I just absolutely love playing disc golf during the day, during the week, filming when nobody else is out on the course. I can wake up at 7.30 in the morning. I can drive two hours, get to a course at 9.30 play until 12.30, drive home, I'll be home at 2.30, and then I go to work at 5. Where else can you do that? Like, it's just so perfect. So, yeah, it's a long day, but that's what you gotta do when you wanna make videos sometimes. And then my disc golf career, over the next few years, I do have some pretty cool plans, actually. Uh, I don't wanna spoil too much, but I haven't even really, I guess I will spoil it, I haven't really even put it out too much on the channel, but a big goal of mine is to buy a van and renovate it, and live in it and travel the country filming a new course every morning editing it in the afternoon and getting it up for the following day it's going to be a lot of work i really have very little intentions of being on the pro tour or national tour i really 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 like i can just i can see it in my mind's eye already playing local tournaments on the weekend wherever i am whether it's a c tier or b tier whatever course i need to play the tournament at I'll play during the week and I'll practice and I'll film a practice round on it and that will be the cycle. Playing five courses, a different course every day, obviously there's going to be burnout and I'm going to be editing and it's going to be a lot of work so maybe I won't stay so super true to that schedule but that is it. That's the plan. I'm 26 years old. I have nothing holding me back. I know I just said that I really enjoy my job and stuff but if I can get myself to a position where this channel can support me due to the grace of all of you guys. I would just be so blessed to be able to make that dream come true. And like I said, no intentions of really hitting the Pro Tour or National Tour all year. I'll probably hit a couple of the stops. My pure intention 
would be to film more disc golf courses than anybody has ever filmed before. And I know that sounds like a very big goal, but I can see it. I can see it now, so stay tuned. And I didn't really even want to spoil all that news, but it was a perfect question for it. Chris Jarden asks, awesome, is the turbo putt the superior method? Definitely not the superior method, um, but I have seen some people have success with it, but I wouldn't call it the superior method. Uh, ben from Fixated Disc Golf says, what is your most uh, memorable moment about working at Dairy Queen, and is there a coworker that has made an impact on you? So <laughs> I think, what's the reply here? Mark says, I can't wait to see the answer to this question. So the most, it, it probably isn't the most memorable, but it's definitely up there in like the top three or, or five. And so Mark actually worked with me for a summer. My camera actually just died. I had to replace my battery. So sorry if the framing is messed up a little bit. Um, but to answer that question, Ben, my good friend Mark, who's been in the vlog a bunch, has worked with me before for one summer. And he graduated school and he was in between jobs. So he came and worked with me for a couple months. And there was a really funny moment. He was our cook. And so there was a really funny moment where, not it was kind of funny now looking back on it, but he, he was going to get cheese from the walk-in cooler to stack the cheese and get it all prepared. And he goes and gets the cheese, goes back over to the, uh, the grill section and starts doing his thing. And I'm over in the ice cream section and all of a sudden milk just starts like leaking through where we use our milk spout for our milkshakes. And milk is just like flying and I'm like, what the heck is going on? I go in the walk-in cooler and there's like literally a waterfall of milk coming down from the top shelf and the whole milk container is pushed over to the right, right next to where the cheese is. And I was like, oh my God. And so I kind of like did what I could real fast to stop it, ran over to the grill. I was like, Mark, did you just go get cheese like 30 seconds ago? And he's like, yeah, what's up? I'm like, dude, come with me. We go over to the walk-in, his jaw drops to the floor. He's like so shook and what he did was the, the big milk carton that has our milk in it is connected to a little tube that goes down and through to the outside where we lift up a thing that drops milk. I know, super confusing, whatever. But he took the big carton of milk and he literally just shifted it and the, the, the tube popped out and the five gallon thing of milk was just going, 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 water falling over the front. And yeah, that was a very memorable moment. Of course, it includes Mark from the vlog shifts the milk crate, milk goes everywhere, and that was that. I mean, we cleaned it up, we moved on, it wasn't that big of a deal, but it was really funny. And then, is there one coworker that has made an impact on you? And yeah, there, there probably is a couple, but one of them that sticks out specifically, he actually just moved to Virginia last month, but he was our cook named Jerry. And so Mark worked with us two years ago, uh, two summers ago in the 20, summer of 2018, and I think we hired Jerry as soon as Mark got his job for the fall. And Jerry was from Haiti, and he moved to Orlando originally, worked in Disney, and then he moved up here, up north, and he ended up finding a job with us. And he was one of the hardest working dudes I've ever met in my entire life. Started working seven days a week, which was fine by him, and he was working the morning shift. And then he's like, you know, I'm not doing too much at home. Like, he'd talk to my boss, and he was able to negotiate working seven days a week, every day, all day, doubles pretty much. He worked literally open to close every single day for probably six months, maybe maybe longer, like at least half a year. And he was still happy, still dancing, like literally you'd come in to work and he's like making food and he's like dancing. And I'm like, what, how are you this happy? You're working every day, all day. I'm literally getting goosebumps just like talking about it. And he was like, from where I'm from, it's a privilege to be able to work this much. And I was like, wow, like I'm literally getting goosebumps just talking about it. And it's just, that puts it in perspective, man. We, we have it so easy. I don't even know how to explain it, but we just, we take for granted our free time. And he was just such a hard worker. And so, yeah, he was probably the coworker that made the most impact on me because he was always so happy and just worked every day, all day. And it was just really, really a good thing to see that people out there can appreciate work that much when they come from, you know, nothing. And yeah, he definitely had the biggest impact on me, I would say. So, sorry to get all somber, but that was that literally brought like goosebumps to me. Michael Laterza said, what was your favorite moment in the past three years? So, that is a very vague question, and honestly, I don't really know, but the first thing that came to my mind was the collaboration that I did with Simon last year, 
that was awesome. Uh, it really took my channel to the next level. It put me on the map a little bit more. Uh, we did two, we did three total videos, two videos for my channel, one video for his channel, and literally in three days, my channel went from 1,500 subs to 4,500 in the snap of like literally a day or two. And it took me four years to build up to 1,500, and then in two days, I was at 45, and I was like, this is so sick. Um, so that was probably the best thing to have happened in the past three years. Um, advice for someone just starting out, currently gauging success on distance, that's definitely not what you should gauge all your success on. Um, and this is from Stephen Dumont, sorry. Um, 350-ish to 400 feet max backhand and score plus 9 through 12 at courses like Wickham. Would love to hear if you've played tournaments this year, but many got canceled. Um, took advantage of the league play towards the end of the year, though. I don't know, it's really tough giving advice to people that are starting out because everyone has their own sort of path that they took to grow as a player. Um, but I always tell people to throw slow, like throw slower discs, because when you're brand new, it's easy to see a 12 speed disc and think that that's the disc that's going to go the furthest for you. Whereas if you pick up like an FD from Dismania, I can get my FD 375 feet and it's a seven speed disc. So it's like, you don't need these really fast discs to get a lot of distance. So my recommendation would be to get yourself some throwing putters and some fairway drivers that are a little bit neutral, maybe even a little understable, and learn how to really throw them hard on a little bit of hyzer. Um, and that, I think, will, will help you with your accuracy a little bit because when you're taking an overstable disc and all you know how to do with it is either throw it on a hyzer or throw it on this S-curve shot, you're very limited to the amount of shots that you can throw. But when you, throw, when you learn how to throw slower discs like a putter, I remember when I first learned how to throw a putter and I learned how to really crank on it with power on a little bit of a hyzer, pop it up straight, it was the first disc that I ever really learned how to throw that would finish flat and straight. Because when you throw a driver of any sort, it's going to skip, it's going to skip, it's going to flare some way, it's going to dig into the ground. But the, the putter shots and those neutral mid-range shots are really good at teaching you how to throw a shot that finishes straight. Because if you need to hit a tight tunnel, you don't want to take out a 12-speed and have to flex it because you're going to hit a tree. So you want to take out a slower disc, throw it on a little bit of a hyzer, or maybe even flat, and just let it ride. So throw slower discs, get yourself an FD from Dismania. I think it's the best fairway driver on the market, and those are probably my best advices. David Galvin, I still haven't made an appearance on the channel, so technically you haven't made an appearance on the channel, but your, your Instagram did make an appearance on the channel in uh, last week's Skins episode, so you kind of have made an appearance on the channel. Uh, nice walk down memory lane for you. says, Kent, fun to watch. My question, in the last four years, do you think you've grown more as a disc golfer, a vlogger, or as a person in general? I know, weird question. Hope to meet you one of these days. I'm going to probably say I've grown the most as a vlogger. Uh, if you go back and you look at some of my early vlogs, like... say like at episode 50 is where things kind of started getting better and then when I got my new camera I think it was around like episode 110 or something is when things really started getting better but if you go back and look at any of those vlogs before episode 50 they are just raw like <laughs> I laugh at them all the time they're so funny and they're so cool to look back on but coming from there to where I am now on the vlog is a huge increase in production value and you know editing knowledge and framing and just figuring out how I want things to go so out of those three disc golfer 2016 I was probably pretty similar to how I am today my putt has changed I'm more of a spin putter now but I think in 2016 I was like 950 rated or something and now I'm like 970 975 so I've gotten a little bit better as a player, but not really like significantly better. And as a person, I don't think much has changed as a person, honestly. I feel like I'm the same exact dude I was four years ago, or even like 14 years ago. I really don't feel like I've changed that much over the years. Um, so I'm probably going to have to say that out of those three, I've probably changed the most as a vlogger. Paul Nimblet says, and thanks for the donation in the skins video, Paul. Uh, Noah, what is your most favorite course to play of all time? or which is the most difficult. I don't know if this is my top three, but Buffumville, Rockwell, and Nantucket are in my top three in some sort of order, most likely. And Rockwell, they're all really hard. Like, Rockwell is super hard. Buffumville was the Skins episode. Super hard, out of bounds everywhere, monster course. Nantucket, par 68. 
lot of par fours and fives that are really true and it's just a really challenging course where if you get off the fairway the rough is like terrible there's no out of bounds but if you go off the fairway even five feet you feel like you're out of bounds so I it's kind of hard to decide but I think my favorite course is Rockwell in Connecticut it is just beautiful has everything backhand crushes forehand crushes par fours um, hole six at Rockwell is beautiful, 750 foot down a valley all the way back up. When you're standing at the tee pad, you're pretty much looking directly at the basket at eye level, but there's like a 80 foot cavern all the way down that goes all the way up. It is such a cool course, so I would probably say Rockwell is my favorite course to play, and they're, they're all really hard. I don't know if I've really played a course. Maple Golds is really hard. I've never shot under par on Maple Golds. Uh, Jano Baseball 3406 says, "What is your best advice slash tips to improve putting other than just practice?" You've you've heard it before, I'm sure. Through not to, you want to putt through the chains, not to the chains. And what that will do is it'll get you into a better mentality of giving it more steam, not trying to have it like just fall into the basket. So through not to is a really good piece of advice. When I when I step up to a putt and I'm nervous, all I tell myself is focus and follow through, focus and follow through. Focus and follow through so that I'm standing there. I'm just trying to tune everything out and the follow through makes sure that I get my hand all the way through so that I don't just short arm it and get nervous and, you know, have it die off left. So focus and follow through, through not to, and that's probably my best advice for putting. Whyhawk Squad, what's the meaning of it? I have no idea. Um, when I first started the channel, right before the first episode, I was walking up to the tee and I was thinking... What do I want to call the people that watch my videos? And at that time, my channel, I started my channel as Huckin' Plastic DG, and I changed it to Daily Disc Golf right around 500 subscribers. Uh, the reason being is because when I was out filming and someone saw me with my tripod, they'd be like, oh, what should I look up? And I'm like, just look up Daily Disc Golf. It's a lot easier than my channel name. And I was like, why don't I just switch it over? And I'm glad I did because at this point, Daily Disc Golf probably would have been taken. So happy that I switched over when I did. <laughs> when are you going to cut the helmet hair off? I can say that because I used to have the same thing. So right now it is actually a little bit long for the style that I started uh, to have last year. But <laughs> my hair right now is not nearly as helmety or as Lord farquaad as it was before I got my major haircut last November. Um, so I have had like sort of short hair with at least short hair in the back for a little bit over a year now, but for a long time, ever since sixth grade, I had like this long skater hair. And so I don't really have any plans on ever like buzzing or going like real short. Um, I think it's, I think I get an eight on the sides and scissors on the top when I go get my hair cut. So that's what I'm doing right now, but never going to like really fully buzz or do anything ridiculous anytime soon. Caleb asks, oh, and that last one was from Adam. Uh, Caleb asks, how far can you throw? So I feel like actually since breaking my hand last summer, I might have lost a little bit of distance that I really haven't gotten back. And maybe I, maybe it wasn't because of breaking my hand, maybe it's just because I'm trash. But I feel like I used to be able to throw like 450 on like a really good flip up smash with a backhand. But now I'm struggling like even breaking, you know, 400 consistently, like 425. Um, I feel like 425 is probably my max at the moment but I can backhand 425 and I can flick like 390, 400 maybe at this at, at the moment. So I'm pretty well balanced when it comes to them too, but if I need that extra distance, I'm usually reaching for my like Enigma on like a backhand pump, but I can get my DD3 to about 400 on a flick and I can get my Enigma to about 425 on a backhand. Gillis asks for Q&A, Junior Dubs Battle 2. I am planning on, you know, messaging you guys and let's schedule a Junior Dubs Battle number two. I wanted to do it at Buff and Bill, but we just did the skins at Buff and Bill, so maybe we can find another course for it. But definitely am planning on um, doing this rematch battle for you guys at some point, probably in February or March. I ask you for flick tips since mine tend to come out way too low and with way too much hyzer, says Vlad. But I expect my problem is a heinous tangle of form issues that can't be properly communicated through text. You love using big words, my guy. Backup question. All of the courses you've never played, which one, which ones do you most want to play? So I really want to play Yarva Disc Golf Course, but I think everyone knows that that's pretty much, I think it's on its way out if it has, hasn't already been out. Um, but I really, really want to get to Finland at some point and just play a bunch of Finnish courses. I think Finland is number two in the world behind the U.S. and they're really growing much faster than us in terms of how many disc golf courses they have. 
I have a whole video with nine different flick tips that I think would improve your flick, so check that out if you haven't already. Alita Battle Chicken asks, chunky or smooth peanut butter? Smooth all day, baby, smooth. Jimmy Disc Golf, yo, look at that fire NASCAR pillowcase. So in this video where I asked about, uh, about questions, I was reacting to my old videos and I was in my old room and you could see my NASCAR pillowcase on my bed and I went nuts. Uh, Jeff says, I'm a new player and I don't want to lose momentum during the winter. I'm up here in Maine. What do you do to prepare for cold slash snow disc golfing? Also more, uh, also, more ideas for actually playing in the winter. Yeah, we have to deal with cold weather around here up in New England, obviously. There are people down south that probably would never even think about playing in snow and ice. But for us, it's you know pretty normal. A lot of us are used to it when we're living up here. You don't want to take the winter off from disc golf. Man, we love it too much. So... I don't know, if there's snow on the ground, grab yourself some carpenter's chalk and what you can do is you can take it and get your disc just a little bit wet on just one corner of it, not where you're holding it. Spray the carpenter's chalk on that little tiny wet spot so that it doesn't fly off in the air. And when you throw your disc and it goes into the snow, you can see the little carpenter's chalk and it is easily findable. Or you can take ribbon from like a crafting supply store and just tape it to the bottom of your disc. Really thin ribbon, probably two feet long. And when you throw it, the ribbon will be sticking out of the snow, so that's another one. Uh, you can get yak tracks, which go on the bottom of your shoes, and they're kind of like little springs or spikes. They have a bunch of different types that you can get. I'd probably recommend the more expensive ones because the $15, $20 ones just probably will only last like a round or two for you because of the way that your foot rotates on the tee pad. But yak tracks are really good for snow and ice and all that stuff. So check out yak tracks, check out carpenter's chalk, check out ribbons, and then just have fun out there. Don't, don't treat it like it's a normal round in the summer because everything's going to fly a little bit shorter and you want to slow everything down a little bit so that you don't slip. Uh, William Boosler says, finally I'll move to Mass, Bend to Boardland, Sunnymead, Hartstuff, Rockwell, High School, Franklin Park. By the way, Sunnymead is my favorite course to play. Wow, this is a long <laughs> message. Probably been waiting over in Big's inspiration. Thank you so much, Will. Take my game more seriously. After that injury that took away for a while, found your video, you and your broken wrist, Really motivated me to push through and not to mention top three favorite disc golf vlogs to watch. Keep up the hard work, my dude. Thank you, Will. Out of all the courses you've played from your first time ever playing disc golf until now, what is your favorite course to play that is not in Massachusetts? So, after all that, I already answered this question, and it's Rockwell in Connecticut. Just absolutely beautiful. If you have a weekend or you have some time to take off, take a trip down there, go to Rockwell and Page Park. They're literally like 10 minutes from each other. Play Rockwell first and then go play Page because Page is a lot easier, a lot shorter, and Rockwell is just a beast. And if you play it as your second round of the day, you're probably going to check out like halfway through the back nine because it is just so hard, so elevated, it's so crazy. So play Rockwell first, go over to play uh, Page Park, and then stop at Geno's for a slice of pizza. That's a fire day. Maxwell Staten says he was actually just on that Huck Squad fan blog, top five courses in Mass. So, all right, that's hard, but in no specific order, Maple Hill, Clement Farm, Buffenville, Borderland, I don't know why I did this, but I'm at four, and I'm probably forgetting one, but I'm definitely forgetting one, and some of my local friends are probably killing me right now because I'm forgetting like a really good one, but I don't know, probably like Flat Rock or something like that. Flat Rock is a really cool course, so that is probably my top five. Great experience, and when will we be seeing a disc with a name and stamp on it? Um, I don't know. Unfortunately, that's not up to me. That'd be really cool if Discmania reaches out to me for some sort of signature disc, but you have someone like Casey White who's slaying and sponsored on the tour team who still doesn't have a signature disc, so I'm not holding my breath. Garrett says, since playing with Simon earlier this year, how do you feel your overall game has progressed? Did playing with him have much of an impact on you? So. I don't think playing with him impacted my play at all. Honestly, it didn't change the way... Uh, the only thing that I really took away from it was during my question and answers video, I asked him about putting and stuff, and he was just like, I just tell myself that you don't miss two putts in a row. And I think about that all the time, because I'll have like a 40-foot putt, and I'm thinking, oh, do I run it? Do I kind of give it a soft run? And then I'm like, I'm not going to miss two in a row. So if I miss this, I'm making the comebacker no matter what. If you miss three in a row, you're a scrub. <laughs> not really, but like that's the way you got to think. You're not missing three in a row. You just don't. It doesn't happen. Oh, no. My battery died. Now my freaking memory card is almost full. Give me a minute.
<laughs> All right, so talking about being a better vlogger since four years ago, huh? My freaking battery just ran out and my storage was almost full before I even started this video. So I'm not sure how much better I've gotten. Uh, moving up to Rainbow John 98 with 2020 being a very difficult year for tournaments and such, has the new tournament changes, i.e. with no spectators leaving after the round is finished, no warm-up at tournament location, changed your pr approach, practice, game, rating? One of the worst parts about my work schedule is that I work the weekends, and it's really hard for me to play tournaments in general. Uh, last year, I was really looking forward to tournament season, and I was clicking on all cylinders, and then I broke my hand, and then my whole tournament season was done after that. I played two tournaments last year, and then this year, pandemic hit. I'm still working weekends. Work has been crazy and just stressful. And so I only was able to play one tournament this year. So in the past two years, I've played three tournaments, which is just so sad to say. So hoping to change that this year, but I still do work weekends. Maybe I'll be able to get more Saturdays off this year than in the past. But that's probably the worst part about my job is that I just can't play as many tournaments as I would like. So don't really have an answer for you on this. Nothing really changed for me. Paul Diabito asks, Dan, what's up? <laughs> As a late joiner to the Huck Squad, this was a pretty sweet recap. 2017 Amwin is awesome. If you could play anywhere in the world, more for the destination than for the best courses, where would you want to play? I want to be able to say I hucked 18 in Australia. So I did already answer this a little bit. I would really like to play in Finland. There's just so many courses out there, and some of the pro disc golfers that I follow that are from there or in that area just have some really cool Instagram stories and posts that they make on these cool courses. So if I could play anywhere outside the US, I would really enjoy playing in Finland. Australia would be really cool too. Ever since I was a young boy, I've always wanted to go to Australia. So David Downham asks, when you were injured, what's something you learned about your game while you were playing lefty that you were able to carry over playing your preferred right hand? Nothing. I didn't learn anything lefty that I transferred over that then improved my game. The only thing really was just how grateful I became for this skill that I had in my right hand just normally. So like when you're playing lefty with your offhand, you don't have as much control and you really can't create your shots and manipulate or manifest your round or really do any of these things. But with my right hand, I could just I could stand still, I could do a standstill flick like 300 feet on an ante on a full S-curve and like get myself out of trouble. But with my left hand, I just can almost do nothing but drive and do some sort of up shots and maybe make a putt. So I think it was just finding gratitude and the skill in my right hand rather than any of the skills I learned lefty transferring over because I have a forehand and a backhand so it's not like I'm ever going to use my lefty shot because it's the same as my righty forehand, just worse. So that's kind of my answer to that one. Kyle Davis asks, what's your favorite round ever? I know you have a favorite episode, but what is your favorite round ever? If not, what is it? I don't know what that last part meant, but. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm gonna disregard the Simon stuff. Um, I have such bad memory too sometimes. Like I feel like a couple months ago in Team Challenge at Burgess Park down in Cape Cod, I had one of probably my best singles rounds ever. I was playing one of the better guys on their team, shout out Joel if you're watching, and we were battling. He went up two, like he went up three, we're playing match play, so it's like a point per hole. He was up three at one point, like halfway through the round. And if you know match play and you're down three halfway through the round, you know you only have really like six holes left because you can't come back after that. So I, I had to turn it on. I went birdie, birdie to take two points because he parred both of those. So now I'm down one and we have like maybe seven holes left. And I smash an ace on hole one Burgess, which is a birdieable hole where almost everyone steps up to at my skill level and expects to just birdie and push. But I aced it and I was so psyched and that tied us up and gave me all the momentum to start coming back. And then down the stretch, the last three holes, the third to last hole, I hit a 35 footer just outside circle's edge. I gave it a little jumper step putt, smashed it to push the hole. I was freaking pumped. Next hole, literally like a 50 foot death putt. He was parked for three. This was my two putt. I even told myself half run it. I didn't even tell myself to full run it. I like half baby bit it. Huck squad gods grabbed that thing and ripped it into the chains. I was so pumped up. So now I'm up one heading into the last hole, guaranteeing my, um, our, our team at least half a point in case he wins and pu we push. So I'm guaranteed half a point at this point. And we both end up 
parring out, he misses his like long 60 foot putt and I win by one. It was, and as you can see just by me telling, talking about it, definitely one of my favorite moments in disc golf. Best, probably my best comeback with an ace. It was just so cool. So that was probably one of my favorite rounds ever. Not to mention I had Ted and my friend Zach there witnessing as well. Zach was on my card and Ted was just spectating. So it was really cool to just have them there for that as well. Who was your favorite team to play against in New England Team Challenge? Um, probably the probably just like our other Borderland rival, uh, the Borderland Billy Goats. It's really fun playing against them. And it's just, there's funly, friendly, funly, there's fun, friendly, competitive trash talk. Um, and it's always a good time whenever we play each other, so I'd probably say it's always fun when we get to play the goats. Well, Flex, but I'd already seen these videos. Keep it up, Noah. Thanks, Paul. No question, though. David Ashbaugh, how many tournaments have you either won, placed in, A, B, or C tier? So, I don't have an answer for you off the top of my head. Um, I think I have, like, three wins, maybe? Uh... I won the Cobblestone Cup, which is kind of like a knockoff Nantucket Open back in 2017 in the amateur. And then I won the 2017 Amateur New England Disc Golf Championships, which was sick. And I think that was a B tier at the time, and it was a two-day tournament. And that was definitely my biggest win ever. I won a $500 gift card. It was so cool. I won another one that was unsanctioned, so I don't really count that. And like I said, in 2019 and in 2020, I've played three tournaments. Uh, I've cashed in all three of them, so I've come in the top 40%. But, yeah, that's pretty much my answer to that one. Don't really play in enough tournaments. Um, have, it, have one big win, a couple other wins, and I have cashed in my last three. Uh, Chris Kulig says, Nice video. It's fun to look back on the progress. I miss Huck and Plastic DG, but it had to go. Haha. <laughs> I remember you were actually one of the people, when I first made the switch, in the comments of the next video, you were like, Oh, man, I'm really going to miss Huck. Like, you actually were upset that I changed it. I remember specifically. So it's funny to see you come back with a comment about it now too. Earn Grave Danger says, what is the furthest course that you have played away from home? As sad as it is, I don't know if I've ever played disc golf outside of New England. I've played in New York and that's not really considered New England. It was only a two and a half hour drive. And I've played up in Maine, which was probably also only like a two and a half hour drive. But, I think that's it. I think I've only played in New England and New York, so I've never driven further than like three hours, four hours maybe. Oh well, Smuggler's Notch, it's technically four and a half, yeah, probably Smuggler's Notch, Fox Run, and Brewster. They're like four and a half hours from my house, and they're kind of right on that border of Canada, so that's probably the furthest course. And last question here from Deanna, or Deanna probably. I'd love to see revisits of other videos. I'm new to the channel. My question is, what advice would you give to a new disc golfer like myself? So, I kind of already touched on this a little bit earlier, um, throw putters. I know a lot of new people don't think to throw putters because they think of a putter as just something you throw into the basket. But throwing putters shows the flaws in your form, it shows where you can improve, it teaches you how to throw hyzer flips um, because it, once again, will show your flaws on every little angle that you put the disc on. Just try to treat throwing a putter like you're throwing a fairway driver. Really rip it, like give it spin give it snap, just make sure it's on hyzer so that when it does turn a little bit, like high speed turn, it will be flipped up rather than throwing it flat and having it turning over into the ground. So throwing putters hard are really good at teaching you how to hyzer flip. Figure out whether or not you're more comfortable backhanding or forehanding. For some weird reason, sometimes you'll give a new person a disc and just tell them to forehand it and they'll smash it like 200 feet on like an S line and you're like, what the heck? And then someone who's been playing for five years still doesn't have a forehand developed. So it's weird. Some people are different when it comes to how you start because a backhand is a very technical throw with a lot of moving parts being your whole core, your whole body, your whole arm. There's a lot that goes into a backhand whereas a forehand is just kind of ripping it on a certain angle and figuring out how a disc flies. So my best advice, throw slow, throw slow discs. Don't throw anything over like a 10 speed, there's no need to, um, unless you feel like you're turning things over and you need that extra stability and that extra speed to, to come out of it. But that's probably my best advice, practice a bunch, um, yeah, and that's it. So hope you guys enjoyed this video, actually it was longer than I expected it to be. At the beginning of the video I said, oh, here for a quick video guys, but coming at you with a quick video today, definitely not a quick video, but 
Hope you enjoyed the reactions to the mystery boxes earlier from Matt and from Lucas. Did a great job and I'm really happy that they filmed and sent it over to me. Um, oh, and one more thing actually. One of my favorite gifts that I got this Christmas, check this out. My brother got me a Huck Squad stamp, which is so cool. And look, I've, I've already stamped my entire, all my discs, but that just comes out so nice and I put it on all my discs and it's just sick. And I took, look at this, this is my rock, my Marshall Street flat top rock. I just put like a million Huck Squad stamps on it and then right here too, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but right there on the top it says thumb here and my thumb just fits like perfectly there. I don't know, I just thought it was funny. And I hated this in the winter because it was white and I'd lose it, but now with all this black on top, I think it's pretty safe to throw in the snow. So just wanted to show you guys that Huck Squad stamp just because it's so cool and it was probably one of my favorite gifts that I got for Christmas. But that wraps up the video. I'm going to stop ranting. I'm going to let you guys go on with your day. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you guys have an awesome day. Like, subscribe if you want to see more. Keep eating your vegetables and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.